All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of hell. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 113, and today I will present a perfect example of why all archaeology from the 18 and 1900s needs to be completely reevaluated with modern technology, with an absolutely brilliant examination from L'Orientale University of the Abu Ghraib Solar Temple Complex, specifically regarding the central obelisk and the system of limestone and calcite bowls. And my primary objective for today's episode was to find some reference and explanation for this dual bowl system within the archaeological reports. Not only was I successful in doing that, but I found something even more spectacular. And just wait until you hear the conventional archaeological explanation for the function of these bowls. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the ancient technology of a lost civilization utilizing physics and chemistry, this is the channel for you. So please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube. And don't forget to click that little notification bell so that you do not miss the new episodes that premiere twice per week. Please like, comment, and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel, check out the Land of Chem members only section. Link in the video description below for exclusive research and unreleased footage that you will not see anywhere else. If you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch, check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Also, don't forget when you finish watching this video, Please go subscribe to Egyptian Trash Cats and Egypt Eats, our two new channels here on YouTube, also linked in the video description below. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. And for anyone that's interested in coming to Egypt to see these miraculous temples and pyramids for yourself, the Land of Chem 2024 Ancient Alchemy and Ascension Tour is on and bookings are now available. For a taste of what you can expect during this life-changing adventure experience, check out the tour promo video. And if you wanna join, please send me an email to contact at thelandofchem.com with the subject line 2024 Egypt tour, and I will send you the full itinerary and pricing details, which includes special permission access to Abu Sir, private entry into all three chambers of the Great Pyramid, and an adventure that you will remember for the rest of your life, a journey into the subterranean chambers of the Osiris shaft. Thank you all so much, and I will see you soon here in Egypt. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. And I will be presenting the data from two different papers in today's episode, both from the same team, links in the video description below. Starting first with this one, a virtual reconstruction of the Sun Temple of Nyusare from scans to ABIM. And I will quote the abstract here so you can understand the impetus and objectives of this archeological investigation. So in 2010, an Italian team started new investigations in the Sun Temple of Nyusare. The archeological survey of the site was planned in order to re-examine the monument after its discovery in 1898. Work is mainly aimed at a general re-evaluation of the archaeological data still available on the site in order to establish a new plan of the temple. More than 100 scans and several 3D models by digital photogrammetry have been acquired. In order to make all 3D data sets for different targets available, a building information modeling BIM project has been developed. Thanks to this new approach, currently underdeveloped in archaeology, it is possible to produce categories of environmental and technological objects which represent the 3D semantic of the model. The paper deals with all the recent achievements, especially regarding the conceptualization of the architectural model. So this is exactly what we should be doing with all archeological studies from the 18 and 1900s. And you will understand why as we proceed through the episode. And a few items here from the intro. First, 
The importance of analyzing this temple is thus clear, particularly when considering that the temple was first discovered by Ludwig Borchardt in 1898, and since then it hasn't been investigated. Also relevant and mentioned within this study is the fact that Borchardt's excavation of Abu Ghraib was one of his first ever archaeological projects. He was an amateur, a noob, as we would say in the parlance of our times, and it appears that his study of this site was superficial at best, if not completely inaccurate, and the Italian team's skepticism and disdain for Borchardt's original work is fairly apparent if you read this entire paper. Next, and I'll quote here, the Sun Temple of Nyusere is quite a monumental complex, surrounded by an enclosure wall of about 110 by 80 meters and composed of the following parts. A central court line aligned with the main entrance, an alabaster altar for cult offerings and rituals in the center of the courtyard, a corridor originally roofed which runs along the three sides of the courtyard itself, a large area on the northern side occupied by warehouses and purification basins, a quote-unquote cult complex in the southern side composed of two contiguous rooms which are usually named chapel and room of the seasons, a truncated pyramid-like basement with a superimposed structure usually called the obelisk in the center of the temple enclosure. The basement and the central obelisk occupy an area of 1,600 square meters and are currently preserved up to a height of about 13 meters. And finally here, the construction of a 3D model and the acquisition of relevant data presents not only important technological aspects, but also gives us the possibility to compare the new survey with Borchardt's reconstruction provided in 1905. His reconstruction, however, presents many inaccuracies, especially in the concern of the shape of the central obelisk. So here, they are intent in using a completely novel approach that utilizes technology to accomplish things that have never before been achieved in an archaeological investigation, exposing the deficiencies in the work that was conducted by these early quote-unquote Egyptologists. So here is a diagram showing the layout of the Abu Ghraib complex developed by Borchardt in 1905. And the area of particular interest to me was his labeling of these two areas here, where the limestone and calcite crystal bowls are found, which he completely unjustifiably calls the great and small slaughterhouses. Yep, you heard that correctly. The original archaeological explanation for these bowls that was developed by Borchardt with absolutely zero evidence is that they were part of a slaughterhouse for animal sacrifices. And I'll be returning to this in just a moment at the end of the episode. Next, on to some of the objectives and the technology utilized in this exceptional modern archaeological reexamination of the site. First, here. The 2014 laser scanning campaign was conducted on the whole of the temple with three main focus areas. The obelisk, especially its basement, which is still quite well preserved. The area around the altar, where several inscribed blocks of granite are still visible on the ground. The entire enclosure wall of the monument and the main doorway of the temple. Attention was here particularly paid to the analysis and scanning of the blocks of the structure laying around the outside wall. So in addition to the laser scanning, they utilized 3D modeling and reconstruction software, photogrammetry, and a variety of new technological approaches to produce some of the most spectacular data that I have ever seen. And they note here, some critical areas fundamental for the reconstruction of the obelisk and the entire monument were in particular acquired by image-based modeling method. First, the main gate of the temple, and second, the area of the so-called, quote, slaughterhouse, especially the area of alabaster basins. And here again, you can get a sense of the contempt they have for this 
quote unquote slaughterhouse nomenclature, which I also absolutely despise. It is an unfortunate example of how the haphazard approach to archaeology in the 18 and 1900s is just accepted unquestionably as dogma without modern reconsideration of the work. And it is basically set in stone as being factual data, when in reality, it is completely inaccurate speculation of explorers who had no idea what they were looking at. And I had to dive deep into the research for this episode, as there is almost nothing that exists aside from the original reports by Borchart about this site, which are all in German, until I just happened to find this extremely obscure research by this Italian team. And I'm really glad I did. So now let's dive into the data and 3D reconstruction modeling so you can see what is possible using modern technology. The first image here on the right, quote, the 3D model by image-based modeling of the area with the alabaster basins. So this has been done with photogrammetry data similar to that from inside the red and bent pyramids of Dashur that I've shown in previous episodes. Next, here are a few images and 3D reconstructions. First, here, the area of the alabaster basins, the fine white limestone threshold of the quote-unquote pre-temple already discovered by Borchardt in 1901, which you can see here, and evidence of a door hinge here. Next, area of the alabaster basins, view of the quote-unquote pre-temple, in the central part on the right, the newly discovered column base in front of the limestone threshold, the column base that you can see here. Here down on the bottom, the area of the alabaster basins, a 3D reconstruction of the entrance portico of the quote unquote pre-temple. And here on the right, the area of the alabaster basins, ortho photo of the quote unquote pre-temple and the associated structures photos and photogrammetric elaboration from M. Osman. All right, now, they also collected a vast array of data from the laser scanning and developed a system for identification and classification of the various technological components located on the site, which you can see here, regarding the technological system schema for the closings of the temple. And you can see here, how the data is compartmentalized, defined, and exemplified with classes of technological units, the technological units themselves, and the classes of technical elements. Here, regarding the closings, explained as a set of technological and technical elements of the building system with a function to separate and to conform the interior spaces of the building system itself than outside. Then they show pictures of the components, explain exactly what they are and how they function, and then provide examples of each type of closure system. This is extremely valuable and thorough archeological data, the likes of which were unimaginable for early explorers. And this type of methodology needs to be applied to every single structure that was ever investigated by the so-called quote-unquote Egyptologists of the 18 and 1900s. Now here is where it gets really fun and even more interesting with the implementation of 3D modeling and reconstruction software, where they scanned existing intact components of the structure, loaded them into the software program as 3D model pieces, and then began to rebuild the site with these virtual Lego blocks. As you can see here, this internal stone block with the L shape that was a part of the pedestal building that you can see here on the right. It was built within the software as a 3D model component and then reinstalled within the structure as if you were building it back piece by piece, as you can see here in blue. And you can see here a close up of that 3D block in blue put back into place. And they have also virtually reconstructed the bowls here in black. 
And I don't know why they only have two, as I found evidence for the housing of four bulls in this area, the other two being located here. And I'll put in a clip now so you can see how this 3D model is literally rebuilding the destroyed ruins that are strewn about the site now.
All right, now, at this point, the modeling within the software may not have been fully completed, or there may not have been enough physical evidence at the site to justify putting these two bowls in place. But it does appear to me that there were four bowls housed here on the southeastern corner of this pedestal building. Next. Here, we have a 3D laser scan of the site and the superimposition of the reconstruction onto the map from board chart. Another amazing example of the integration of new technological mapping of the sites to compare and contrast with the existing and accepted archaeological data. And here we have the visualization of the 3D model of Nyusare, in particular, different rebuilt blocks superimposed on the digital acquisition. And as you can see here, that they are literally virtually rebuilding the structure block by block within this modeling software and then superimposing that image on the laser scanning of the existing ruins. And I was totally awestruck when I first saw this as it has so many applications and implications for all of the other sites that I've been investigating. And to reiterate the point of this entire episode, this is exactly what they should be doing with every single structure that has been studied in the 18 and 1900s. Not only here in Egypt, but just imagine how this technology could be implemented with the destroyed ruins across the world. And the last image from the first paper featured in this episode, a comparison of two alternative hypotheses about the height of the central obelisk. Again, with the 3D modeling, rebuilt construction, superimposed on the scanning data of the ruins. Awesome. Now, on to this paper. Sun Temple of Nyusare in Abu Ghraib report of the 2017 season. And I will quote again from the abstract here. In January 2010, an Italian mission from L'Oriental started a new archaeological investigation of the Sun Temple in Abu Ghraib. During earlier campaigns, we realized that the plan drawn by Borchardt contained some inaccuracies, and most importantly, his drawing and 3D reconstruction of the main part of the temple's architecture, namely the so-called obelisk, was not convincing. Therefore, the aim of the mission is to produce an updated plan of the temple, as well as a new proposal for a three-dimensional reconstruction of the obelisk's structure. Documentation works continued by the fifth season last year, lasting from the 4th of November to the 30th of November 2017, and including also a topographical survey of the area located to the south of the Sun Temple, which has never been systematically explored. And here we have a three-dimensional reconstruction of the Sun Temple of Nyusare after board chart in 1905, showing a very tall pedestal building and corresponding obelisk, which has now been proven to be an inaccurate representation. Here, we have the new model showing a much lower pedestal building and two reconceptualizations for the size of the central obelisk. Now, onto some of the laser scanning data and a component of the structure that I never even knew existed. As you can see here, these are two images of the current remains of the pedestal building with the height indications in color shown in section A, B, and C. 
The color elaboration emphasizes the different components of the building architecture, as well as the different sizes of the top blocks in light pink, in comparison with the rest of the core masonry blocks immediately below in dark pink. And again, this is an elaboration in the BIM 3D modeling software based on laser scanning and photogrammetric data. And as you can see here, there is a corridor that leads into the pedestal building on the south side, as you can see here in orange, yellow, and green. And again, down here in orange, leading to the yellow and green. And I have seen this area in person on several occasions, and it is completely indistinguishable within the current ruined state. But it becomes readily apparent when looking at it with this new technology. You can see it again here, leading into the south side of the pedestal building and winding up toward the top of the pedestal. As you can see here, a 3D reconstruction of this feature, combining both bore chart and the new data, showing the entrance on the south here and the internal walkway spiraling up to the top here. And this ramp leads out to the top of the pedestal so that this area of the structure was accessible. And I can't wait to go back out to Abu Ghraib and see this site again in person, as this data has helped me to better understand the site in development of my own theory about how this structure operated and what was really going on here. And this research has given me even more of a heightened sense of reverence and awe for this spectacular site. And I am truly grateful for this type of work and that it's still being done here in Egypt, as obscure as it might be. And I'm even more delighted to have found this research so that I can share all of this with you, but that is not the end of the story quite yet. They also took all of the fragments of red granite scattered around the central altar, some of them featuring hieroglyphic inscriptions and others with tubular drill holes and other various shaped housings and were able to reassemble them digitally, producing this, a sketch and reconstruction of the doorway formed by two of the inscribed blocks found around the altar as a CAD elaboration, incorporated the tube drill holes as components of a door hinge mechanism. And they proposed that the altar was originally contained within a walled structure that produced this dual hinge doorway. They also created this, a general plan of the Sun Temple with the reconstruction of the original layout overlapped on the current pieces of archeological evidence that documents every single piece of stone laying around the site, including yellow and white limestone, red quartzite, red granite, alabaster. And you can see here on the Northwest corner, the multi-level quote unquote storehouse area. Here and here are the two areas with the limestone and calcite bowls. Here you can see the internal ramp leading up to the top of the pedestal building to reach the central obelisk. And here is a complete 3D digital recreation of the site by Patricia Zenfagna from this team showing the grooved paving stones leading to the bowl sites here and here. The completed chamber surrounding the central altar here. The dual set of bowls with their own grooved paving stones here and the internal ramp leading out of the pedestal building toward the top of the obelisk here. Absolutely amazing work, but there is one huge part missing that they don't even attempt to address, which is the function of these two bowl systems. So now let's return to the conventionally accepted archeological dogma from the early 1900s. 
as proposed by board chart, as you can see here, that these areas, the so-called big slaughterhouse and small slaughterhouse for the ritual sacrifice of animals. And I have never heard a more preposterous explanation for anything out of ancient Egypt in my time researching the subject. And there is absolutely zero evidence that has ever been found at Abu Ghraib to support this conclusion. It is complete nonsense, as you can see here. From Mark Lehner's book, The Complete Pyramids, and I will quote this section here. In front of the obelisk and aligned with its center axis stands an altar consisting of five slabs of white alabaster. The central element takes the form of a circle flanked by four slabs with the top carved in relief of the Hotep hieroglyph, a stylized conical bread loaf on a reed mat. This is a sign for offering satisfied or peace commonly found and the base of false doors in the Old Kingdom. The whole arrangement can be read as may Ra be satisfied. There were no obvious signs of burning. Perhaps burnt offerings were placed on another offering table fitted to a granite socket nearby. So they call this an altar for offerings, although there was zero evidence of burning of offerings. Next, certain features were interpreted by Borchardt as belonging to a large, quote, slaughter court, including fragments of limestone pavement that had been raised above the level surrounding the court. Channels carved into the upper surface perhaps ran to a row of nine large alabaster basins that still survive. Each basin had a series of small, circular, shallow dips carved around the rim. Borchart thought originally that there were 10 basins and that the channels drained fluids, either the blood of sacrificed animals or the water in cleaning up after the sacrifice into them. However, Werner doubts whether this was a place of slaughter at all. No tethering stones, flint knives, or bones were found, in contrast to such evidence in the abattoir next to the pyramid of Renifrif. Perhaps offerings were ritually purified by laying them on the alabaster altar. The channels and basins certainly suggest that liquids were involved. A similar but smaller installation was found north of the obelisk with seven more basins, this time of limestone and containing three drainage holes each. So he clarifies that they have no idea whatsoever what these bowls were for, other than the fact that they involved liquids. But once again, the blatant lack of knowledge of simple fluid dynamics is apparent in his statement about the quote unquote three drainage holes. Well, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, as the holes are near the top of the rim, and a drainage hole would be at the bottom. But for now, let's move on to this paper here. Quote, the trilobed disc in the tomb of Cebu and the basins at the Sun Temple were for beer. So this guy thinks that the schist disc in the Cairo Museum was used for stirring beer that was being brewed on site at Abu Ghraib. Another idea that I could not disagree with more, but he does say here that there was a total of 19 large basins, nine alabaster basins, supposed to be 10, one is missing, and 10 similar basins of limestone. The function of these basins is not yet known. The discoverer board chart claimed that they were either to collect the blood of the victims that were sacrificed in the paved area or the water used to clean the area after the sacrifice itself. But this interpretation has serious weakness as pointed out by Werner, that neither in the great or small slaughterhouse nor anywhere else in the whole temple has there been found any unmistakable archeological evidence for the killing or sacrifice of animals. To reiterate, it is a completely unsubstantiated fallacious conclusion. Furthermore, Nuzolo and his team that I have been referencing in today's episode shows that recent archeological investigations at the site deny such interpretation and rather support the idea that the slaughtering activities did not fit 
the ritual purity of the temple according to the Egyptian mentality. So this is now the more accepted idea that these bowls are for some sort of ritual or ceremony of purification, known in the ancient times as lustration. But once again, they make no notice or distinction in the extreme differences between the configuration of the two sets of bowls. Each set is absolutely unique and they have completely different functions. The limestone bowls have three distinct holes, two curved and one straight with a circular rim. The second site is calcite crystal with a single straight hole and neither one of these research teams even bother to mention the fact that the calcite crystal bowls were lined with copper. As evident by the remains of the green copper oxide, which you can see here, that still remains in many of the crags within these calcite crystal bowls. And of course, per the usual, when archeologists have no idea what something is, they say that it must be for some ritual or ceremonial purpose. How many times have we heard that explanation? It was literally the only thing we heard when exploring the ancient sites of England and Ireland, that it must be for some ritual or ceremonial purpose. And it was blatantly clear that they have no idea what these sites were really for. But they have to say something, lest they admit that they have absolutely no clue. So in closing, let me leave you with this for now. Some fascinating data from my team at the ACIDA project showing, as always, that there is much more going on at these sites than may meet the eye. Specifically regarding the central altar and they took some readings of seismic activity surrounding this component of the site, some pretty interesting results, as you can see here. So on the left are the readings taken from around the square frame on the outside of the altar, showing very little seismic activity. However, when they tested, the circular centerpiece of the altar. The readings went crazy, as you can see here on the right, indicating that there is something going on beneath this circular centerpiece of the so-called crystal altar. So for now, ladies and gentlemen, this is just the beginning of attempting to understand the mysteries of one of my favorite sites in Egypt. And of course, all of this has been working toward developing my own theory about the function of this quote unquote solar temple, its obelisk, and the perplexing bowls, which will all be revealed when it's ready. But good research takes time, and this investigation that I've presented today has been a major piece of the puzzle in understanding the function of Abu Ghraib. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 113 the obelisk and crystal bowls of Abu Ghraib. I really hope you enjoyed today's video and in this week's Sunday site visit, the absolutely gorgeous, captivating footage from our expedition to Cairo Keel. This is an episode you do not want to miss. So if you're interested in the ancient technology of a lost civilization and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world, this is the channel for you. So please subscribe to the Land of Kem here on YouTube don't forget to click that little notification bell so you do not miss new episodes that premiere twice per week. Please like, comment, and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel, check out the Land of Chem members only section. Link in the video description below. The most recent episode explained the function of the Avebury Serpent Temple Complex and the symbolism of Kubal Khan. If you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch, Check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Also, don't forget, after you finish watching this video, please go check out and subscribe to our two newest channels here on YouTube, Egypt Eats and Egyptian Trash Cats. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, I really appreciate your support. I think that is it for today's episode. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube.
and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.